All right. Well, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. Uh, really exciting to be doing these events live, being able to broadcast them into the homes of uh, families, educators, parents, students. It is so awesome to be able to use technology to do this. As I said before, welcome to Explore Our Classroom. And on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see you all today. National Geographic believes in the power of exploration and wonder to change the world. The heart of our National Geographic community is our explorers who are cutting edge scientists and researchers, transformative educators and powerful storytellers. Explorer Classroom's live video events connect students with National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As and a commitment to supporting educators, students, and families during this transition. We are now providing Explorer Classroom every weekday at 2 p.m. Eastern. So if you'd like, we can see you right back here tomorrow. So today we are very lucky to be connecting with Shannon Switzer Swanson. Shannon is a water woman, a photojournalist, and a social ecologist from San Diego, California. Shannon works with coastal communities in Southeast Asia and Oceania to understand how they can most effectively manage their resources to sustain both uh, their livelihoods and a healthy environment. She recently spent a year in the field working and living and conducting research with traditionally nomadic fishermen of Eastern Indonesia. So she's gonna give us a little bit of a lesson today in just a moment, but before she does, I want to acknowledge that we have hundreds of groups tuning in live via YouTube right now. Um, and we have even more students joining us live on camera today from their homes. We're excited to have everybody here, uh, groups joining us from across Canada and the US. There's far too many to name and we'll do our best to get to as many questions, but we've got groups in Texas, in Seattle, in New York, in Toronto, in Vancouver, uh, in Alberta. We've got groups joining us in Connecticut, in Florida. We've got groups right across North America. It's so great to have everybody uh, joining us live today. But that is more than enough for me. It's now time to turn things over to Shannon for today's Explorer Classroom. Shannon, so awesome to have you joining us today. We're excited to get to know you a little better. And then I bet there's going to be a lot of questions coming your way. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. I'm really, really excited to be here with you all. And um, it's so fun. This is the most people I've connected with in a while. So <laughs> um, it's great to see the faces I can see. And it's so great to be connecting with everyone out there that I can't see. Um, but we'll, we'll be sharing with and um, hearing from, I'm sure, too. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Uh, sometimes it takes me a minute, so just bear with me. <laughs> That's okay, sometimes technology is not as fast as we want it to be. <laughs> share, yeah, right here, PowerPoint. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So why is it not going? Apologies. Uh, That's okay. Let me know if I can help you out in any way. Um, usually if you just double click once the list comes up, it usually cooperates pretty well. Hmm. Okay. It's routing me. Yeah. I don't usually, usually it just, when I hit share, it just does it, but it's routing me to a menu and then I'm hitting desktop and then it's saying open system preferences, which I, I've never had to do before. So let me see. And then it's saying privacy. Oh, it might just be that your computer, uh, sometimes settings can change on the computer and you might just have to switch uh, to give permission. So Zoom uh, will let you share your screen. Okay, that's strange. Okay um it wouldn't be technology if it was easy and was the same every single time shannon true true <laughs> uh okay yeah this is funny okay so i'm gonna zoom will not be able to record the contents of your screen until it is quit okay so just to make those settings go official if you mm -hmm. leave the call and then come back in i'll entertain the crew uh for okay. a minute to do that and then you should be able to share after that Okay. All right. I'll be okay. back. Sweet. <laughs> okay. Okay. While we made, wait a minute for Shannon uh, to pop in and join us, I'll give a few shout outs that I can see uh, online right now. Again, I'm not going to be able to reach everybody. We've got Alexis hanging out with us in DC. So Washington, we've got Milton hanging out in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, oh, we've got a group joining us from China. Very cool. Vihan, that's awesome. Alexis uh, is joining us. We've got a group in West Virginia. looks like Becky's hanging out with us got Ivan in Spain. So we've got 
uh, Rishi in India. So that's great. So not only do we have groups joining us from across North America, but we uh, have groups joining us uh, from other countries and other continents. So that's really cool. It looks like at least three other continents uh, joining live into the events today. Sophia, New Jersey joining us. And it looks like Shannon's back and gone full screen for us. Unmuting. Okay, we're good. <laughs> All right. Awesome, Shannon. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody for your patience. Um, yeah, and that's super exciting. Welcome from across the world. Um, it's so fun, as I already said, to connect with you all. So Joe already let you know a bit about my background, so I won't talk too much about that, but I am um, I worked as a photojournalist for a long time, and then I went back to school, and I'm currently a PhD student at Stanford University, and all of our classes have gone online as well for spring quarter, so we're all in this together. <laughs> um, and my, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research today. I often refer to it as the destruction paradox. Um, and I know I'm talking to a big range of age groups here today, so I'm going to try to cover the gamut so it makes sense to everybody. Um, a paradox is often something that is something that just doesn't quite make sense. Um, and what I'm looking at is why people across the world um, often destroy or negatively impact the very resources and environments that, that we depend on. Um, and that's a very big question. So I look at it specifically within small scale fisheries. So fishermen who are catching and um, selling fish at a more of a local level um, in, across their communities and sometimes um, in bigger markets as well, but they use more traditional uh, fishing methods. So I'm gonna jump into that, but before I do, um, oh, now it's not letting me arrow forward. That's not good. Sometimes just because uh, when you went live, if you click on your screen and then try airing forward, it might cooperate for you. Ah, ah. Perfect. Joe's the master. He knows everything. <laughs> this is great. I've done one or two um, of these events. <laughs> nice. OK. Um, so before I get, jump into my research, I wanted to share a bit about how I got to that work. Um, and I'm guessing this is a familiar, these are familiar characters to some of you. Um, so this is Marlon Nemo's dad and uh, Dory from Finding Nemo and Finding Dory, um, the hit Disney movies. And in 2015, right when I was starting my PhD, I got a grant along with other National Geographic explorers, a storytelling grant to document the global aquarium fish trade. So to see where these fish like, like Dory the Blue Tang um, were actually coming from in the wild. So that, um, so we were really looking at the real life journey of Dory, as you can see here. Um, and what we found was that actually almost 90% of aquarium fish come from the Philippines and Indonesia, which you can see here in this map. And that's not surprising because Philippines and Indonesia are within what conservationists call the coral triangle. And that's what you see on this map that looks uh, somewhat like a triangle. Um, you can see that yellow outline. And that includes six countries and they call it the coral triangle because it has more species of coral and fish than anywhere else on earth. Um, there's over 600 different species of coral, which is a really large amount. Um, and this is a photo from my field site. Um, and then there's over 2,600 species of fish. Um, and then within these different species, there's what we call endemic species. So species that can only be found in one place in the world. Um, and that's what this little guy is. So he's called a Bongai cardinal fish. And he's a very popular aquarium fish species um, that's only found in the Bongai Islands, which is where I did my field research. So the coral triangle is a very unique space. Um, I apologize for the quality of this map. Um, but what's also going on in the Coral Triangle is there's a lot of people, uh, fishermen and fishing families who depend on the resources there um, to, for their livelihoods and also for protein and nutrition. And what's evolved over the years is fishermen sometimes using destructive practices. So this map is showing in the red is where there's lots of, been a lots of observ observances of using uh, what we call blast fishing, which can be bombs or dynamite to catch uh, food fish, and then poison fishing, which is when sometimes fishermen use things like cyanide 
uh, to stun fish. So they are, um, they're easier to catch, but then can be brought back to life, um, not brought back to life, but resuscitate later so they can be sold alive. Uh, which is what we do for the aquarium trade. So uh, the little blue part that's circled, that is where my field site was in central Sulawesi. And you can see there's a high occurrence of these, um, what, what are termed destructive practices. Um, <clears throat> so that's the, that hence the paradox of these communities that really rely on these resources, but at the same time by using them have um, in some cases been somewhat destructive in their approach. Um, and then, now I'm gonna focus in on Indonesia. So um, I, we were looking at the whole coral triangle there and I'm gonna now hone in on Indonesia since that's where I did my uh, thesis research. And within Indonesia, there's 60 million people that are uh, live within 20 miles of a coral reef. Uh, and so they're again, very dependent on these ecosystems. And then, but the paradox again is that 80% of the reefs in Indonesia are thought to be threatened by these destructive practices that we just talked about. So just to give you a visual of some of these, um, the bomb fishing. So these fish were killed using a bomb. Um, and when a bomb's detonated uh, in a certain area, then pretty much within, a, it depends on how big the bomb is, but within a ra certain radius, all the fish are, are killed. Um, and many of them are collected and many of them are used uh, for food fish or um, sold uh, on the market. But a lot of them that are too small and aren't the right species like this fish um, is that's a, for a size reference, that's this, my, my index finger. So a lot of them are just too small to be worth um, the fishermen taking the time to catch and, and sell um, or eat. So there's a lot of waste that occurs. And then of course the coral uh, there's many different types of bombs, but the, some of them really do uh, break the, the seafloor. So some of them are detonated from cables before they hit the seafloor and they don't crush the coral, but when they hit the seafloor, they're really destructive to the coral as well. And then I mentioned the poison fishing or cyanide. So um, there's, there's a couple of different types of poisons that can be used, um, but cyanide's a very popular one. And, as you probably have heard of it before, because it it's, is um, a very deadly poison. If we eat it, we die. Um, and so what they do is they dilute it. They put it into a bottle like this and mix it um, with water. And then they take it and they squirt it out into an area where they see the specific fish that they want to catch. Um, the fishermen that I was going out with, they once they felt more comfortable being around me, they started using this, um, but I should say that dynamite fishing, bomb fishing and poison fishing are illegal in the places where I was. Um, so that's something I was always keeping in mind and um, I wasn't wanting to get any of these fishermen in trouble at all. Um, I was keeping everything confidential um, and <clears throat> really wanting to just understand why they make, what motivates these decisions around their fishing practices. Um, the other way to catch aquarium fish that's thought to be more sustainable is using these small nets. And some of the fishermen, when I was first going out with them, they would use the nets, um, but were not very highly trained with them or highly skilled with them. So um, from my observation, they could be uh, fairly destructive as well, just from the nets getting caught and, and pulling you know, coral heads up and whatnot. So the nets can be much more sustainable, but the fishermen still really need to be trained properly in them. Um, and so this is one of the fishermen that had caught blue tang with the net method. Um, so as Joe mentioned when he introduced me, I am a marine social ecologist as a researcher. So what that means is I use methods and theory from the fields of anthropology, psychology, and ecology um, to understand these social ecological systems or human and nature systems that interact with each other. And what that means is I do interviews, sometimes recorded on a camera, but often just more informal interviews. Um, I use what's called participant observation, where I live with communities and embed in them um, and really observe the day-to-day -day happenings. Um, and, oops. and so that's what I, so I use those uh, mix of methods uh, to really understand what's going on in a given context and in a given community and system. So that's what I did for my 13 months of field work for my PhD. And this is 
Um, so we, I showed you central Sulawesi within Indonesia earlier. And then this is specifically in the Bangai Islands where I was. So I lived with three different communities. The first one, the circle there is um, Bone Baru. That community, I'll tell you more about these communities in a second. So that was Bone Baru. Then Popisi is the second one. It's very close to um, Bone Baru on the main Bangai Island. And then the further out island um, is Toropot, and that's um, out, it's about a five to six hour boat ride on a very slow boat. Um, and so that's a further, further out. It's closer to uh, the next province over in Indonesia. Um, so this is Bone Baru where I lived. Um, and I lived with a family who worked with a local conservation NGO. So a nonprofit organization that worked with fishing communities to make their um, practices more sustainable. Um, so I lived with the family who was field staff for that NGO. Um, and this community is predominantly a farming community. Then I, at Popisi was that second one that was close to Bangai or Bone Baru. And um, this is um, Popisi and then the community of Toropo, they're both the traditionally, predominantly the traditionally nomadic um, people group, the Sama Bajau. So they lived uh, in the past predominantly in boats and traveled around and now they often live in these stilt houses over the water. Um, increasingly, they're moving their houses to land um, because of different pressures from the government and economic pressures. But these communities where I, where I was at least part of the community was still over the water like this. And so part of my part of my data and my research was really living day to day with the family. So eating with them. This is Mami Adi. She's making a traditional um, food called kukus. And um, then I would participate in different religious ceremonies when it was appropriate and um, other social and um, day to day activities to understand the culture better. And then, of course, one of the really important things was going out with the fishermen and observing them out on fishing trips. So I was, I did about 50, over 50 trips with 15 different fishermen and um, many, many hours on the sea. And um, I absolutely, it was a real privilege to be able to go out with them and to have them be willing to share their space with me because as you can see, these are pretty small um, spaces, these boats and they're, often the most precious um, thing that the fishermen own and they are what allows them to make a living. So um, it was a real honor to be able to go with them. And you can see we shared tight quarters. This is, um, I'm all covered up because um, I'm not used to the sun in the way that they are. And this is Papa Sinta and he's looking for uh, octopus fishermen. So we'd be tilted this way half the day while he's uh, using his goggles to search around for octopus and he's using a lure, which I'll show you in a minute. And then this is Papa Sinta. So he, cut, he does octopus and squid. So this, he caught squid this day. Um, this is Papa Dika and he's a line fisherman. So he would use that hand line. You see, he doesn't have a pole or anything. And he's really skilled and he uses that hand line to um, catch food fish. <clears throat> and this is Papa Adam. So he's a spear fisherman. He uses a compressor, which you see he has in his mouth, the regulator. And that attaches to a compressor up on top of the boat, up on the surface. Um, and it's quite a dangerous uh, profession. So they're, and they're very, very skilled divers. Um, he's also, I meant to say, an, an aquarium fisherman too. So what I found was a lot of the spear fishermen, because they have the equipment with the compressors to also do the aquarium fish um, catching. So he would catch aquarium fish. This is Papa Rendi, he is a spear fisherman. Um, this is one of the fishermen from Popisi. And he, this is the lure, one of the lures they use to catch octopus. So he made that out of fabric and, um, steel for the head and they dangle that above the reef and then the octopus that are territorial will come out and attack the lure and then they catch them. Um, this is uh, Papayati. So he actually had just been using that lure and then he had successfully caught an octopus, which is, was always very exciting because there's 
a lot of monotonous hours out on the sea <laughs> when you're not catching anything. And then the last type of fisherman that I went out with was um, what they call a boo-boo fisherman. This is Papa Chichi and he, um, and I should say, sorry, the names are from, stem from the name of their firstborn child. So if his firstborn child was Chichi, so he's Papa Chichi. Um, and you can see in the bottom left side of this photo is the traditional boo-boo trap. It's made out of bamboo and they put it on the seafloor and then cover it with these little coral fragments to uh, camouflage it and then fish swim in but can't swim out. Um, <clears throat> so there's this very wide variety of fishermen um, who use lots of different traditional and more modern techniques. And um, one more form of data collection that I did was a project a research method called Photo Voice. And so we loaned cameras to over 50 different fishing families um, to use and take pictures of their day-to-day -day lives. And they could be, take them underwater and whatnot. Um, and then we would talk about what, how those photos were meaningful to them. Um, as part of understanding their lives. So what did I find about, um, you know, I started with this very provocative title of the destruct destruction paradox. Um, and so there's a few things I found. I'm still going through, I still have so much data that I'm going through as I, um, as I continue to understand and answer this question. Um, but I wanna play this video um, to give you, a sense of what it often is like out on the water with the fishermen. Um, and so what I found is fishermen, like anybody, they wanna do what's most efficient. Um, they wanna catch the most fish they can in a short, you know, in the shortest period of time and with the least energy possible, especially because they're dealing with conditions like this that are really rough. They're in small boats. Um, it's either they're, being seared by the sun all day in like sweltering conditions with no shade or it's raining and freezing. Um, and so they want to be efficient. They wanna catch the most amount of fish or whatever their target species is that they can in a short, you know, the shortest amount of time possible. So if there's not an alternative uh, solution, if there's not an alternative way to catch fish um, that's equally efficient, it's not a very convincing um, sell for them. Um, Oops, nope, no. <laughs> Aha, so I'm bringing, now. so you saw this photo already of Papadika. And the other thing that I learned is that with bomb fishing, there's two types of bomb fisher, people who use bombs. So there's people like, um, uh, there's fishermen who use bombs occasionally when the weather's really bad, they can't get fish the way they normally would which, with less destructive methods. And they're really frustrated and they just need to feed their family for the night. Um, and I observe this in different settings. And then there's fishermen who actually are bomb fishermen. Their primary way of catching fish is with bombs and they use quite, quite large explosives. And fishermen like Papadika, who's using hand lines, which are a very sustainable way of fishing. Um, uh, several times when I was out on the water with him, with him he would have trouble just even catching fish to start fishing for the day. So he would have to catch bait fish. He couldn't buy it. He didn't have the money to buy it. So he'd have to troll his line on the back of the boat when we were heading out to catch fish that are not, don't have market value, but that, that he could then use to catch these fish, like these coral trout and other species he could then sell for a profit. So there were days we'd be three hours in, four hours into fishing, and he still didn't even have fish to start the day. And in those cases, if we saw a bomb fisherman, he, he could tell who they were. He would zoom over to them and he would say, give me fish to start fishing. Um, and they would, they would give him fish to start fishing and then he'd get on with it and earn his living for the day. So he didn't use bombs, but his, um, he was actually helped by people who were using bombs. Um, and that was a big part of what I saw is that it's a really big part of the social fabric and the way they maintain relationships among each other is being able to share fish. And so often when there isn't fish around um, from using the regular methods, bomb fishermen will still have fish. So they can, uh, they really are a social, um, they provide social good to the community in that way, uh, albeit a short term good. But um, so that's uh, another reason why it continues. And then in Torapote, the further out island, 
the overwhelming majority of fishermen that I spoke with um, were, did not want their sons or their, well, prim primarily it's the sons who would become fishermen, um, did not want them to, to follow in their footsteps. They really wanted them to become something else. And really they wanted them to become some, uh, to do some job that was in an office. That's what they would always say. They just need to work in an office. It's like air conditioning and you know, not having to deal with the elements. So this is Papa Adam and his son, Adam. And that was the case for them. Um, Papa Adam was very concerned about the next three years because he just, he really wanted to send his son Adam through college. So he was doing that and he was paying for that through the fish he was catching. Um, but it was, you know, his short kind of his window of thinking about this, um, this resource was the next three to five years, not the next 50 years. Because in his mind, if he could get his son out of the fishery, he doesn't have to depend on the ocean anymore. And so that's, those are some of the quick summary of things I've found so far. And that's building on other people's research as well. Um, and this photo is from uh, Popisi, so that's the community that's close, that's on the bigger island, that's already worked with the local NG, NGO Linny. And they have already, so this image captures sort of what the, what Linny has been working on with the community there. Um, this is a celebration of after they had reopened an area where they had temporary closed, temporarily closed um, to fishing. So if you see that island in the background, they'd closed around that area um, to fishing for specifically for octopus. Um, and so Linny, the community actually asked for that closure so that then once they opened the fishery, um, they could uh, hopefully have a bigger um, supply of octopus after they'd had a chance to breed and grow bigger. So Linny through these sort of programs, they were helping the fishermen collect data on octopus. So they could see throughout the year what months they caught more of the octopus versus less. And then with that data, they said, this is when you're really not catching very much octopus in the months of December, January, February. So if we close it then, you're not losing a lot and you have a lot more to gain once we open it. So through different programs like this um, and efforts to sort of uh, lengthen the horizon for the fishermen to think about like short-term sacrifices for a longer-term gain. Um, the community has had started to think more about this as a resource that their sons and their grandsons and and hopefully eventually granddaughters could benefit from well into the future. And um, some of them still wanted their kids to go to school, but there was more of them that were starting to think, oh, this is viable well into the future. They can keep doing, you know, if we do this well, um, our, the resource will still be there. So that's that. And then I want to end, this is my last slide. I hope I didn't go too long over. Um, to say that fishermen often are targeted by conservationists and other people for, you know, being destructive to the environment because it's really obvious when they are or when they're taking things from the environment, but we all um, are affecting the planet's health. So all of us, our day-to-day -day actions can have positive or negative impacts on our environment and on our, the ecological system that we're a part of. Um, and I just want to all, you know, all of us to remember that and um, to think about ways that, and how our actions today are impacting the health and the state of our future planet. Um, and so it's something we can all improve. And um, I have lots of thoughts about how, and, but I wanna open it up to uh, questions to everybody. And um, thank you so much for your time. All right, awesome, Shannon. Thanks for that great presentation. I mean, it looks like you get to work in some beautiful places around the world and interact with some, some amazing communities. So you get to see a different way of life and immerse yourself in those communities. That's pretty cool. Absolutely. Um, so for the folks joining in from home, mm -hmm. I just want to issue a few little challenges for you for after this event. If you're in grades kindergarten to grade five, we're challenging you to draw a picture or a comic strip about something you learned from Shannon today. If you're in grade five to eight, your challenge is to write a short news article or story about Shannon. Um, and then in high school, your challenge is to produce a short video that uh, explains something you learned today. Uh, and then you can share those videos via social media, like on Twitter, tag at Nat Geo Education, hashtag Explore Classroom, 
and we'll make sure that Shannon gets to see any of the cool uh, projects that uh, groups do after these events. And now let's move on to some of our questions. So if you're online right now, use the chat sidebar, let us know where you're watching from and include a question. And then we are going to start talking to some of our uh, live camera uh, groups that are joining us from home. How's that sound, Shannon? That sounds great. Okay, and then if you just hit the stop screen share for me at the top, we'll get you back nice and full screen for the questions. Oh, great. Okay, before I do that, I had forgotten sure. I had this um, slide. So in case, because I know a lot of you are at home, um, you want to take a deeper dive in specifically into the aquarium trade. Um, this is an interactive website that our team developed with, that brings you through each step of the aquarium trade. So um, it's reef to aquarium.com. And I just thought that um, I would share that with you in case you want to check it out. Yeah, of course. It's a great um, website. I highly suggest you check it out. Awesome. Okay. I will stop screen share. All right. So we'll take the first question from YouTube. This is a, a really good one. Dana's wondering, Shannon, if the communities have ever been suspicious of you when you first arrived. Yes, that's a really, really good uh, question. So um, initially, what I connected with those communities through um, a middleman who was buying and selling aquarium fish uh, within the communities. And so with him, initially, there was some trust um, uh, because I was, he was kind of acting on my behalf. And so I did several, I did two trips that were shorter, about two months each, um, where I just introduced myself to the community. I got to know some families there. I figured out where I could stay and got a sense for whether or not it'd be okay for me to do, you know, they were welcome, open to me doing research there. Um, and so that all was fine. When I came back to actually do the longer research, um, there was some concern um, that I was a spy and that I was, um, especially you can imagine because I'm, my, my, great, my broader research question is what motivates fishing behavior? So I, I wasn't just interested in like just the destructive side of that. Um, but of course, I'm asking questions about that, and um, that can be concerning because these, you know, this is they depend on this for their livelihood. So yeah, absolutely, I had to really um, spend time working through that and explaining. We had a big, we had several community meetings explaining that this is all, um, you know, that this it's confidential, and um, I'm really wanting to uh, partner with the communities to see how these this data can actually benefit the fisheries in the future. So. Yeah, really good question. All right, keep those questions coming online. Anything's fair game about uh, Shannon's work, life as an explorer, diving, uh, the species of fish that she gets to see, uh, all's fair game. So let's go to a live group now. Let's go to Riley in Orlando, Florida. Riley, your microphone is on. Do you have a question for Shannon? Yeah, I was wondering if um, the amount cost for a fish is over probably the year it is. If the, say, can you say that one more time? Sorry. The year it is born or in the, the year it is born, mm -hmm. um, is that usually the cost amount of it or it, it doesn't depend on what year it is or it just depends on the size? Oh, I got you. Okay. Yeah. Good question. So the, it, it really depends on the species of fish, but I'll talk about the aquarium fish um, and I'll talk about the blue tang specifically. So um, it actually, the small, not too small, but the smaller sized fish are actually the more valuable now because, um, so that's actually the younger ones because um, they're easier to ship, they're less expensive to ship, um, and they are more efficient to ship. So actually um, now it, it changes. Initially, larger ones were more expensive, but now um, when it's in that first stage from the fisherman selling it to the middleman, um, they're actually uh, more valuable, which is interesting. And then for food fish, generally, if it's, or octopus or anything that's to eat, the bigger um, the size, the more money they're gonna get. So they, they typically target larger animals that are gonna be older, typically. All right, awesome Good question, question. Riley. Uh, let's do one more from live before we go back to YouTube. Let's go to Washington, DC. We have Lucia joining us. Lucia, how you doing? Good. And um, what time do they catch the fish? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, 
the fishermen, I'm not a morning person. So I was um, going out very early in the morning. Sometimes they go out 3 a.m. Um, and then they come back by noon. Um, it depends on what they're catching. So sometimes it's better to fish at night. Uh, and it also depended on if there was like a full moon or, or a new moon. Um, the fishermen are really keyed into all these environmental things. So they know the tides and they know the, um, the moon cycles and all of that determines when they decide to go fishing. But most often it's very early in the morning. <laughs> yeah, good question. All right, let's jump to a question off of YouTube. Lots of good questions coming in uh, via YouTube, but let's start with this one. Amber's curious about uh, what was the hardest part of this assignment? Was it emotional? Was it hard to get adjusted to the accommodations? What was tough? Yeah, I think the um, the most challenging part, which is it's all like I, I set myself up for this, um, but I was learning, I was still, I had a working knowledge of Indonesian and when I arrived for the longer term project. Um, and so I was still, you know, learn, I was still really learning Indonesian. And then there's a lot of local languages that people are very excited for you to know. Um, and so I was trying to learn those as well. Um, and so I think that just, it was really challenging not being able to communicate as effectively um, as I had hoped that I would already be at a higher level when I got to the field. Um, so that was probably the, the most difficult. And one of the field sites was, um, in an area that didn't have any connectivity. So I had a sat phone and my husband was here, which was also really hard. Um, so I would only be able to communicate with him like once a day with a sat phone text. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was definitely really challenging, but I did find that the communities uh, were just were just really incredible in you know doing what they could to make me feel at home and um, just being really gracious, so. All right, let's go now back to Orlando, Florida. We have uh, Solben joining us. Let me turn the mic on. Hey, Solben. What's the most funniest thing that happened while you're working? The funniest, too. Hmm. It's a good one. I haven't asked that before. <laughs> um, let's see. So, well, one time, I don't know if this is the funniest, but this is one thing. Um, I was taking pictures um, of the fishermen catching aquarium fish and I leaned on something on the boat. This is on the boat, leaned on something on the boat to like get a good angle. And I just fell into the water. I just fell right into the water with my camera <laughs> and I managed to keep my camera above the water, but the fishermen thought was, that was hilarious. They thought it was so funny. So <laughs> I had to laugh too. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Uh, we're gonna go back to Washington, D.C. We've got Avery hanging out with us. Avery, your microphone's on. Uh, so I have like two really fast questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what, what month is the best month to, to fish there? Good question. Um, so that is also, that's really dependent on the weather again. And then also the, the um, spawning cycles of different species. So in, in, in Toropot specifically, and it also was different just from Toropot to the other um, fishing community, Popisi. But for Toropot, the best fishing months were the calmest and they were in, tended to be in October, November and December because it was very calm and flat and much safer for the fishermen. What was your second really quick question, Avery? Um, uh, um, do they fish in the, do uh, the fishermen fish in the winter? So they do, they fish year round when they can and it's not too dangerous. Um, and it's a day-to-day -day call. They'll wake up in the morning and see if it's, you know, the weather is going to be too rough for them or not. Um, but they, where they are, they don't technically have a winter. They have a rainy season um, and a, a very windy season. Um, and then like a hot, humid, still season. Um, and they refer to it as the North weather and the South weather. So it's a little different from us, yeah. All Good right, questions. We'll, come, we'll <laughs> come back to our camera classroom shortly, but let's grab another one off YouTube. Multiple groups are wondering about this, Shannon. If you hmm. are out doing your field work and you see something, whether it's maybe using poison or using explosives, is there someone you can report it to while you're in the field or is it better not to because you don't want to you know, lose the position, I guess, the trust that you have? Yeah, that's a good question. It was, a, it, um, I found the whole 
effort to understand destructive practices of very precarious because of this. Um, and I don't know why I didn't understand that it would be before I went into the field and was in this situation and, and uh, making these relationships. Um, but as a researcher, first and foremost, um, and given, you know, the how I presented my research to the community and the understanding we had um, is my first and foremost priority is to protect them. Um, and so I, I wasn't there to report anyone. I wasn't going to be most. The thing is that the, the local authorities know that these things are happening. Um, and often um, they do they do appreciate when people report things, but um, it just wasn't my position to do. And um, I wasn't I didn't feel comfortable doing it. And my understanding with the government, because I have to get government permits and whatnot, was that everything was going to be confidential. Um, I could share what I learned, but not anything about specific people or individuals. Um, so that was really important to me and so it remains important to me because I really want the communities to benefit from this and not not be harmed by it. All but right. really good question. It's a tough. Good question. Quite a few are wondering about that. Yeah, uh, we've got a group of students joining us in Texas and they're wearing their dive shirts for today. Really cool. I love those. Uh, who's joining us there? Uh, I'm Addis and I'm Perrin. Awesome. Do you guys have a question for Shannon? Uh, yes. Uh, I have a question that is, what religion did you practice in Indonesia? Good question. Yeah. So you saw in that image that um, but the communities I was in were predominantly Muslim. Um, and I'm not Muslim. Uh, I'm, I'm Christian. So I, I practiced my own version of that faith of Christianity while I was there. Um, and, but I um, very much in, engaged with the cultural parts of the Muslim celebration. So if they had holidays or they had um, different festivals or food that they part, you know, partake, partook in, um, then I would, I would participate in that sense. But um, the communities didn't, they didn't feel it was right for, for me that someone that wasn't a devoted Muslim to actually wear the, you know, wear the headdress and wear the um, various ceremonial um, clothes. So, and I didn't want to because I'm not Muslim, but um, there was a, they were very understanding. They wanted me to participate to the extent that was appropriate. Um, but yeah, that's how I, how I handled that. Good question. Great, great question. Uh, Chloe in Orlando, your microphone is on. Go for it, Chloe. I have two. My first one is why did you choose Indonesia to do your work? And my second one is where were you able to share any sustainable fishing practices in Indonesia and when you were there? Good question. So good questions. Um, so the first one, um, what, oh wait, I already forgot the one. Let me answer the second one. So the second one um, was, no, so I wasn't, so that's a really interesting point. And actually a lot of the fishermen when I first showed up were like, tell us how to do everything well. You know, like tell us, tell us, you know, you're from America, you have lots of resources, like tell us what we should be doing. Um, and my, I was coming with the, the viewpoint of wanting to learn from them and really wanting to understand what you know motivates their uh, fishing practices. So um, I think that initially they were a little disappointed because I wasn't, I wasn't coming to say do this and do this and do this. Um, and um, I was really coming to learn from them. But what I hope to do um, is after I go through all and finish synthesizing all of my data and analyzing it, that then I'm going to return to the communities and share what I learned about. Okay, this is what's currently going on. This is my understanding of it. Um, have them tell me if some of that's incorrect from their point of view, but then also share uh, ways that I, I see for them to be able to move forward to be more sustainable. Um, and then what was the first question? Sorry. The first part was why Indonesia? What made you choose that spot? Uh, of course. Okay. So Indonesia, um, if you remember from the very beginning of the presentation um, that Dory brought me to Indonesia initially. So 90 or uh, almost 90% of aquarium fish are come from the Philippines and Indonesia. And then what we found was um, this supply chain within Indonesia for the blue tank specifically. So that's what brought me to Indonesia. Um, and then I just, I fell in love with being there and um, had developed these relationships with the community. So I decided to focus on, on Indonesia. 
All right. Awesome. And then we have to visit Luke. Luke, you're a rock star, buddy. You're so patient. Uh, go ahead, <laughs> Orlando. Okay. So um, while, while you were living there, what was the most unique animal you saw and the most unique uh, uh, animal you ate? Ooh. <laughs> Good. Um, okay. The craziest animals to me that, that I saw are these, um, it's a, it's in the crustacean family. Um, and it, it burrows in the sand and it looks like this like alien, um, creature that pops up out of the seafloor. Um, and I'm totally spacing on what it actually, it's a, it's a species of mantis shrimp. Do you, have you guys ever seen those? But it's really long and big and it looks like so alien like so I love seeing those guys so it always yeah those are super cool we I did see some sharks as well um there's the sharks are pretty overfished like they've been overfished in the area but I did see a couple uh white tips and just small reef sharks um which was cool too um and then eating strange things well, the, that mantis shrimp I was talking about, I didn't know you could eat them, but they actually, you can eat them. And a family happened to have caught one um, and they fed, they shared it with me. And it was actually, it tasted like, like lobster or shrimp. It was, it was pretty tasty, <laughs> but I never would have thought you could eat that. All right, that's, that's cool. Let's grab one more question from you two. We've got Sid the Seahawk joining in. Uh, and Sid is curious about, so we talked obviously about overfishing uh and fishing practices that have a negative impact but did you see any evidence of pollution maybe plastic pollution uh have an effect on these communities yes that's a really good question so unfortunately yes there was a lot of plastic pollution and um what's happening is you know we uh in america and europe um are exporting our our sort of convenience culture um and we, you know, everybody now has these plastic wrapped, you know, single item things. Um, in even in the remote islands where I was in, in Indonesia, they come in on big ships and they have, you know, single packet um, shampoo and single packet for everything. Um, and then also little snacks and all, you know, everything we have here pretty much um, they is now being exported all over the world. So the problem is, I mean, Plastic pollution is a big problem here. We don't have the right infrastructure to deal with all of it, but we do have some. But in where I was in Indonesia, there's literally in those remote villages, there's really no infrastructure to deal with plastic. Um, and what that plastic is replacing are packaging is packaging that was biodegradable. So they used to use a lot of banana leaves and bamboo and um, all these very biodegradable things to package what they would eat. So they're very used to just throwing it in the ocean and not thinking about it, which is fine if it's biodegradable. But yeah, so plastic is a huge issue um, and it's something I'm still thinking about how we can work with the communities there to help manage it better. All right, Shannon, to wrap us up for today, we have hundreds of young explorers tuning in today. What is hey. some advice that you would give to any young explorers who are tuning in today? Okay. Ooh. This is always the fun part. Um, well, I think the I think the most important thing um, is that you always have um, lots of questions in your head, <laughs> and you're always thinking about um, uh, why are things you know always always kind of looking around your world and your space and thinking why is this this way why is that that way um, how can I contribute to you know cleaning up my local park or how can I um, get more involved with this physical space that I'm a part of, this physical community that I'm a part of. Um, and I wanna say, you know, I did this work in Indonesia, but my first ever project with National Geographic was in my own backyard in San Diego where I grew up. And that actually the image behind me is from San Diego. Um, and I was looking at water quality there and um, water conservation. So um, you, can, you can be an explorer anywhere. While you're trapped in your houses right now, you can be explorers. You can learn more about how your house works. You can learn more about how to make it more energy efficient. Um, you can be asking questions and trying to find information online. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to be an explorer. So that's my, my big advice. And also more practically, um, National Geographic has a ton of different grants um, for different age groups uh, for uh, funding these different projects and ideas you might have. So um, I really encourage you to look into those and and pursue them if you're interested. 
All right. Awesome, Shannon. Great advice. So to everybody tuning in, check out Explorer Classroom and many, many more educational resources at natgeoed.org. We hope to see you coming into some of our future events. In fact, join us tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern for Dinosaur Discovery with uh, Diego Pohl. He's a paleontologist who studies dinosaur evolution. So he's discovered Ooh. over 20 new species of dinosaurs, crocodile, lizards uh, that obviously lived millions of years ago. So definitely want to come uh, and check that event out. Um, all right, so uh, first of all, a huge thank you to everybody who tuned in via YouTube. Thanks for sending in all the amazing questions. Sorry we couldn't get to every one of them. A huge shout out to the groups who tuned in live on camera with us. Thank you for the awesome questions. And Shannon, thank you so much for spending a little time hanging out with us today. Absolutely, thank you so much, Joe, and everybody for tuning in. Stay well and healthy and keep exploring. <laughs> all right, all those on camera, your microphone is on. Let's get a big goodbye and thank you for Shannon today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, awesome work. Welcome. Texas, so great to have you all joining in. Thanks again, Shannon. And we are signing off from today's Explorer Classroom. See you tomorrow.